All right, so today we're going to go ahead and talk about the Druid. And I'm really excited about this because while I personally don't play the Druid, my wife mostly plays Druids. Um, so I'm really excited to see what changes they're going to make to it. And I've heard a lot of good things, so let's go ahead and jump on into it. Hello, everyone. Today we are talking about the Druid. There is a ton of new in the Druid. We took a careful look at our nature friend, the Druid, and looked at every root of its tree, cultivated its garden, and so much now is either brand new or enhanced in this class. And a lot of this development that we did in the class, members of the D&D community were with us on the journey through the Unearthed Arcana process, but the final version has even elements that people didn't get to see as a part of the UA process. And the new starts right at first level in this class. So you now have, as a druid, a brand new feature to select at first level, uh, Primal Order. And inside Primal Order, you get to make a choice. And that is whether you're going to be what's called a warden emphasizing sort of having more armor and being able to use martial weapons, or are you going to pick magician to, to lean more in the nature magician direction? This choice point really gets at the fact that the druid, going all the way back to its origins in first edition, has always had a bit of a split identity. There has been this sort of melee weapon using path as well as a full spell casting path and so what we've decided to do and we did a similar thing in the new version of the cleric we've made it so that we forefront that choice and you get to decide as a player of the druid which side you want to lean more on uh, and so if you pick uh, warden you're going to get proficiency with martial weapons as well as with medium armor uh, whereas if you pick Magician, uh, you're going to get an extra cantrip, and you also gain a benefit when making Intelligence Arcana or Nature checks. And this benefit is getting to add your Wisdom modifier to those checks. So in a way, you're getting to use two ability scores mm -hmm. when you make those checks. Oh, wow, okay. Cuz you're So they stack. They yeah. stack. So like if you make if you're a, a magician druid and you make an intelligence nature check, you're adding both your intelligence modifier and your wisdom oh, modifier. Oh, that's amazing. I love that. And that's really focusing in on the fact that this is a druid who is all about not only nature magic, but knowledge about the natural world and about magic itself. At first level, we've also enhanced the, the druidic feature. Uh, this feature used to uh, teach you the secret language of druids, which is called druidic, but this now also gives you uh, speak with animals uh, because we wanted to right there at first level, we wanted druids to have an easier path to doing this very iconic thing for druids, which is conversing uh, with critters. And in the art for this class, you see a druid there happily surrounded by all of his animal friends. Now, the spellcasting feature is also still at first level at, for druids. And the Druid's spell list, like all of our spellcasting classes, uh, has been reviewed, expanded, and this list benefits from the additional spells that are in this player's handbook. Now, at second level... So, I like the changes they, they made. I like the fact that they're adding stuff to the first level. Um... Telling your players to make a decision at the first level, whether you want to be a melee fighter or, um, you know, a spellcaster is kind of weird to me for a class like this. Um, because no matter what, you're not going to have the spell slots to be only a spellcaster. And I don't have the, the druid cantrip list memorized, but I can tell you that I don't think there are enough cantrips to warrant... Um, any kind of combat or healing should you run out of spell slots. 
for the druid. Um, so I do like that the that the modifiers stack. That's that is a, a neat little trick. Um, yeah, I don't know how I feel about making your players choose. Uh, they did it with the cleric. They did it with the paladin. It's just it's weird to me. It's an odd thing to do. Um, but who knows? Maybe it'll work out. Um, I love that that you get speak with animals at first level, no matter what. It's just here you go. Um, the only other thing that I think should should go to druids, maybe not the first level, but maybe second or third level, is uh, uh, speak to plants, um, because that's that's <laughs> another key thing that druids do. They speak to nature in general, not just animals. But I do love that. I think that's that's really cool, and it really plays well into um, the druid as a whole. And uh, that's fantastic. I love it. Lore-wise, I love it. The new keeps coming. Uh, <laughs> because we have a majorly improved wild shape, uh, which is such an iconic feature for druids. Yeah. This ability to harness primal magic to adopt a beast form. Uh, so f right off the bat, the major enhancement here is all druids can now wild shape as a bonus action. Right. This used to be uh, a, a feature that belonged to the Circle of the Moon subclass, and we wanted to make it easier for all druids, regardless of subclass, to transform uh, into a beast should they decide to use their wild shape in that way. That's amazing. And this leads in how I phrased it into the other new thing at level two, which is the wild companion feature. Because we also wanted to give people other things to use their wild shape on. Uh, wild shape, of course, is fun to use to turn into animals, but sometimes a druid player doesn't want their druid to be turning into animals. And so we wanted to give you other things you could use your wild shape for, and Wild Companion right away gives you that. And that allows you to uh, use one of your uses of wild shape to cast the Find Familiar spell, uh, because we wanted to make it easier for druids to have a, a critter friend yeah. uh, with them. This is a feature that we introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, but it has now migrated into the core so that now all druids have this option. Perfect. Now, there are other enhancements inside Wild Shape, uh, in addition to it now being a bonus action for all druids. We have also now made it so that druids can continue to speak while they are in a wild shape form. Yeah. Uh, because we've really embraced the fact that when a druid adopts a wild shape, they're not literally an animal. They are this very magical person, this druid who is simply appearing in an animal form. And so we wanted you to really be able to retain your character a bit more while you're in one of these animal shapes so you can still participate in social encounters uh, even if you're there as a cat uh, we we didn't want druids to feel like that when they shape shift they're now suddenly excluding themselves yeah. from certain types of encounters as we go up in in the levels with the druid you're going to keep seeing new features, uh, because we didn't just add in that choice point I mentioned before in primal order uh, at first level, you also then get carry on options later on. So when you get up to level seven, there is the elemental fury feature where you again get to decide, do you wanna lean more in the direction of spell casting or in the direction of weapon use. Now, one of the fun things that we did here is this later choice is not determined by your choice at first level. You can actually mix and match. Yeah. So even if you decided to go more the spellcasting route at first level, you could instead go the 
primal strike direction at level seven, or you could keep going. All right, see, so this is another thing I have an issue with. Um, if you're gonna force your players to make a choice at the first level, don't don't make that choice redundant or irrelevant at the seventh level. It's like stick to your guns. Like I think it's a dumb thing to do in general, but like stick to your guns, stick to your choices. Um, you want to make bad choices. Well, that's life. Um, I don't know. It's, I guess it's cool for a, a customization standpoint. Um, and I, I know I'm just being nitpicky here. A lot of people aren't going to agree with me on this, but it's like, I don't know. So you, if you're going to force them to, to pick, do you want to be a, a warden or do you want to be a magician? They pick magician, then they're a magician all the way up until they multi-class. Um, or, you know, pick warden, they're going to be a warden all the way up until they multi-class. Like, oh, well, that's the point of choices. Um, otherwise, you're not really giving choices. You're giving the illusion of choices. And I'm going to double back on, on the wild shape. Um, I hope, I love the changes they made to wild shape, or the additions, rather, that they made to wild shape and the, the wild uh, companion. Um... I just hope that they explain Wild Shape a little bit better in this handbook because I know there's a lot of confusion about Wild Shape in the 2014 handbook to such an extent that um, I actually had to make a, a short about how it works. So hopefully they explain it a little bit better. I imagine it still runs the same way. Um, if If they still have an obnoxiously uh abysmal description of how it works you can always double double check on my uh my short on wild shape i think i did a pretty good a pretty good job of explaining how it works and if you have any other questions you can always ask in the question in the in the questions in the comments below i'm always willing to answer questions i'll make videos to answer your questions if needed if lots of people have the same question um yeah, don't be afraid to ask. I, I love uh, hearing from you guys. In the spellcasting direction with potent spellcasting. Then at level 15, you get improved elemental fury, and this improves whichever one of those options you chose for elemental fury at level 7. Now, before both of those, there's another new feature in the form of wild resurgence, which allows you now some flexibility in terms of how you use your spell slots and your wild shape uses, uh, where specifically you can give yourself a wild shape use by expending a spell slot. So if you've ever played a druid and yeah. you've been in the situation where I'd really love to shape shift again, but I'm out of wild shape uses, but I have all these spell slots sitting around. Well, now you have the option of converting an unexpected. I'll take things druids have never said for 200. Let's be real. Druids will use their spell slots like, like they're going out of style. Uh, the whole point of a spell slot is to use the spell. I've never once heard a druid complain. Oh, man. I wish I could wild shape again instead of having all of these spell slots. Hmm. Hmm. Poo. No, it doesn't happen. In fact, a lot of the druids I see, a lot of the druid players, um, forget they have wild shape. My wife being the only caveat to that rule because she loves being an animal. Fine, whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh doghouse for me uh yeah a lot of druid players forget that they have wild shape because while it's it's one of the biggest things of being a druid is changing into an animal um they don't fully understand how wild shape works half the time and even when they do they don't really have an animal that they can wild shape into because the the fine print of it is it has to be an animal you would have seen before or have seen before throughout the campaign um, and so there's not really anything that they've seen before or they would have seen before that will help in this particular combat. So they'd rather use their spell slots and just fight. Um, so it's, I've never heard a druid say that. And I 
don't think I ever will. So that's just that's just way out of pocket. Don't get me wrong. I think it's cool that they can give up a spell slot for another charge wild shape. I just don't think anyone really will. Ah, let's keep going. Bended spell slot into a wild shape use. But it also, once per day, can go in the other direction, where you can expend a use of your wild shape to give yourself a level one spell slot. Now, the farming spell slots. That I see happening a lot. People will do that. Every chance they get uh, until they, you know, until first level spell slot is kind of pointless. I, every chance they get, people will be giving up a charge of wild shape for a first level spell slot because, once again, they forget they have wild shape or they don't have a use for wild shape in combat because they haven't seen anything that would be useful. So that is super cool. I love that. Um, but <laughs> it's, I can't get over what he said before about wanting to give up a, a spell slot. For wild shape uses, you can just keep doing that until you've run out of spell slots. Yeah. But the other direction of taking a, a wild shape use and turning it into a spell slot, that you can do just once and then need to complete a long rest before you do it again. This is very juicy with Elemental Fury, because as you said, you're, like, you're adding your Wisdom modifier to a Druid Cantrip's damage, or you're choosing to get extra damage when you're using Primal Strike in a, like, a melee form. And that, that continues into Improved Elemental Fury, where that your range of your cantrips significantly increases yep. uh, by 300 feet, yep. <laughs> making a really nasty spell sniper, and then also primal strikes, the damage keeps going up. So you are, you are more in the fight as this druid, and it just gets better and better, and you keep on getting to make that choice multiple times. By the way, one reason in Improved Elemental Fury we increased the range so much there, if you choose potent spell casting, uh, for your druid cantrips is at level 18 you're going to get beast spells which allows you to cast your spells even when you're in a wild shape form and we wanted you to be able to easily use your cantrips once you get that <laughs> at range <laughs> while you're like flying around yeah as a it's bird. like a giant eagle you're just like yep. <laughs> that's perfect now at level 20 the arch druid feature has been majorly enhanced. Uh, first, you know, whenever you roll initiative, if you have no uses of wild shape left, you get a use back. Um, but before I was talking about the that conversion of wild shape uses into spell slots and how before uh, you could do it just once per day, well now, Archdruid has the nature magician component where you get an even better version of that. Uh, on top of us keeping the old fantasy of the druidic longevity of once you've reached the, the point of where you're an Archdruid, yeah. you, you, you're aging, uh, you know, basically slows to a crawl. Uh, and you know you're almost sort of you're you're like a treant uh, <laughs> where you're gonna you're gonna hang you can hang around in the woods uh, for many 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 decades. And it's always such a nice narrative hook, especially for the end of a campaign if you're playing a druid and you get to twentieth level because you are the character that might see, you know, in like kind of the the post story, right? You know, the epilogue. You're the character that might see everyone grow old and pass away and see their children grow up and their grandchildren grow up and you can kind of be the narrative hook for what happens after the story is over. And so what all of these all of these new elements bring to the druid is look look that's cool from a lore standpoint. Um and I'm definitely gonna use that for in future campaigns, um should anybody reach the twentieth level as a druid. But I mean, shit. Raise your hand if you've ever made it to level 20 in a single class. You won't ever see my hand go up on that one. Look, I know I've said it in every video so far, and I'm going to say it in every video in the future. No one is going to the 20th level in a single class 
unless their DM doesn't let them multi-class. It's just not going to happen. Even new players don't do that. By the time the, the new player hits ninth level, they're like, okay, I'm bored with this class. But we're in the middle of the campaign, so how do I make it more fun? And then the veteran players teach them how to multi-class. That's the way of things. It just is. I'm sorry. Making all of these these 20th level boons, even moving them down to the 19th level, isn't going to do anything. Nobody's going to get to them. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you put so much work into these, and they're just never going to be seen. Okay? It's just... I don't think I've met a single person who's hit level 20 in a single class. I know there are people out there, okay? I know there are people out there. I've seen DMs who don't let their players multi-class. Those players usually don't make it to level 20, though. They make it to level 15, and then the campaign's over, and they don't want to play again, or at least not with those same characters, right? It gets tedious. It gets repetitive. It gets boring. Just boring. I love bards i do i would play a bard in every single campaign if people would let me my wife won't let me play bard whenever i'm playing with her anymore because i do shenanigans okay but i would play bard every chance i got but by the ninth level i'm multi-classing and that's pushing it okay it's just stop putting work into these these 20th level feats because nobody's getting to them we're not Thank you for the for the thought. But we're multiclassing. One one level into any other class means we can't hit 20th level druid. You circumvent that in some of the classes by making it yo, know, you only have to hit nine level nineteen in this class. If I'm putting one class, one level into another class, I'm putting three to get the subclass. And if I put three into any other class just to get their subclass that bars me from any any end level feat for any class and i'm okay with that because none of them are so good none of them have been so good that i want to just completely forgo multi-classing not a single damn one and that's okay is you have way more control now as a druid player to chart your course. Yeah. Uh, whether, again, you want to uh, focus more on spell casting, on weapon use, or a combination of the two. It's up for you to decide. And you also get to weave into that uh, how you want to use your wild shape. Are you going to have a wild companion? You have more options as a druid than ever before. And you also have... Uh, a new cantrip, Starry Wisp. Yes. The druid, uh, like all of our spellcasting classes, gets to enjoy some brand new spells. And in the druid's case, that's, there's not only Starry Wisp, but also the new Elementalism uh, cantrip, uh, which allows uh, the druid and others who have it to shape elements in various ways. And Starry Wisp, <laughs> uh, going back to it, is a really nice... Uh, ranged cantrip for druids. Let's talk about uh, the Circle of the Moon. So the Circle of the Moon is the subclass of the four that is most concerned about wild shape. Yeah. This is the subclass that allows you to take the utility of wild shape and give it a reliable combat dimension. Because most druids, they certainly could use wild shape for fighting, but often they're going to be better off relying on their spells in combat and using wild shape largely for utility purposes, whether it's you know to fly or climb or sneak into a place. Circle of the Moon, though, is all about changing into a beast form and fighting in that form. And so with that in mind, we have introduced a number of enhancements in Circle of the Moon. Uh, we've made it so that in their circle forms feature, uh, there 
AC is more reliable than it was before mm -hmm. because before when they transformed into a beast, they had to use the beast's AC and sometimes the beast's armor class was actually lower than the druid's armor class. Right. And because we want you to be able to comfortably keep fighting in the, your beast forms, even at higher level, we introduce this new ability to use either an AC equal to 13 plus your wisdom mod or the AC and the beast, whichever one is higher. Yeah. Uh, so that we you can hopefully uh, withstand those hits uh, in your beast form. You also gain temporary hit points now uh, when you transform. Now, this is true actually of all druids when they shapeshift right. using uh -oh. wild shape, but uh -oh. the circle of the moon druid gets We're even more temporary hit points. And Unnecessarily. the gain of temporary hit points in wild shape replaces what it used to do with beast hit points. Because it used to be then in wild shape that you would transform into a critter and essentially have a new hit point pool. Yeah. And then when that critter's hit point pool got zeroed out, you would then move back to your other hit point pool. That actually created a number of issues yeah, uh, it did. for other parts of the game system. No. Because uh, there are a number no, of things for the in players. the game that are triggered by someone dropping to zero hit points. Right. And we didn't. Okay, so it didn't cause any issues with other aspects of the game whatsoever. It didn't. It was real simple. If you shapeshifted, you had the beast hit points, and you hit points at zero, you, you were knocked out of your wild shape, and you're back at whatever hit points you were at before. Okay. It's super simple. Your hit points technically never hit zero unless they did so much damage to you as a beast that the extra damage over knocked you to zero. So that never affected any aspects of the rest of the game. I don't know what he thinks he's talking about, but I do like this. This, by the sounds of it, it looks like what's going to happen is you're going to get a set of... And I should probably finish listening to what he's going to say, but I'm going to go ahead and just guess here. Uh, you're going to get a set of temporary hit points equal to the beast's uh, hit points. And once, and then you're still going to have your hit points. And once your temporary hit points at zero, you're going to get knocked out of your wild shape back into your normal form with your hit points still left. That way, nothing ever hits zero except for the temporary hit points, which... If you think about it as all the beast hit points really was, that's all you had to think of it as. And that's how I always, you know, describe it to my wife as was that's temporary hit points because it's temporary. Once it hits zero, you go back into your shape, you know, you lose your wild shape. But it sounds like that's what's going to happen. But let's let's see if I'm right. Actually want those things to be triggered when a druid's beast form reaches zero yeah so we've made that that they system trigger should the go beast, away the hit points by at zero. now having wild shape simply give you some temporary hit points when you transform but you keep using as a druid your own hit points and you can maintain that form using your own hit points yes uh so oh. When those temporary oh oh okay so your temporary hit points are going to hit zero, and then you're going to continue being that beast. And then when your hit points hit zero, you're just down. Okay. Hit points go away. You, you, it doesn't knock you out of the form. So Wild Shape now also, for all druids, lasts longer than it used to. Uh, because you used to be knocked out of the form when you lost your the temporary hit, points hit points of the creature. Uh, and that that combo, of course, still is not the case because you don't have that creature's hit points anymore. Right. Uh, you simply get temporary hit points. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, you are not knocked out of wild shape when you lose those temporary okay. hit points. The Circle of the Moon now also has a feature that called Circle of the Moon Spells that gives them a list of spells that they can cast even while they are in their beast forms. Uh, this is a fun new enhancement for them. Uh, they used to have the ability while they were in uh, beast form in 2014 to heal themselves mm -hmm. while they were uh, in beast form. So here's the thing. Um... And correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that you couldn't cast spells while wild shape because 
you couldn't talk. You're an animal. Um, which they got rid of that because you can now talk as, even even when you're wild shaped. So if you can talk, you can think about the spell. You should be able to cast the spell. I don't. I don't know. Because wild shape. I don't know. Maybe that was just me. Maybe I'm the only one that perceived it that way. We decided to supercharge that by replacing that feature with a list of spells, including Cure Wounds, so they still have the option of casting a, a, a healing spell on themselves uh, while they're in beast form. But now they also, of course, have the option with that spell to heal somebody else. They can also cast Moonbeam, Starry Wisp, and that higher levels conjure animals Fount of Moonlight, which is another brand new spell, and Mass Cure Wounds. We did this because we wanted there to be also more of the moon flavor in Circle of the Moon. And so you'll see throughout that you're not only transforming, but you are essentially illuminated by this lunar magic. And the reason why we've always associated the moon with the shape-shifting of the subclass is partly because of the classic folkloric thing of the moon, you know, causing werewolves and others to transform. Yeah. And that's why those two elements are combined in this subclass. So at higher levels, uh, you also now have the option of having your beast form attacks deal radiant damage. Again, this sort of, again, yeah. this lunar theme. Um, and also you have enhanced saving throws. You will also then at level 10 with Moonlight Step, uh, you can start teleporting as a bonus action while uh, you are, are you know, really leaning into the power of your subclass. And one of the nice things uh, about on top of that, you also get advantage <laughs> when yes. you do that teleport and, and on your the, next attack. Roll. The nice thing too about uh, Moonlight Step is this does not require you to be in beast form uh, okay. because we wanted to make sure that you also were getting a feature that wasn't relying on beast form. Right. Even though this subclass is primarily about using Wild Shape, we wanted you to have at least one cool thing you could do even when you're in your non-beast form. Yeah, and then there's no traffic jam of you trying to turn into your beast form ahead of time if you wanted to use this ability because those are both bonus actions. Then at level 14, uh, you're going to get lunar form, which means that when you attack in a wild shape, you're going to deal extra radiant damage. Uh, and also, when you use that Moonlight and then, Step ability, and uh, you will be able to not only God. teleport yourself, but one willing creature. So bring along a friend. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. All right, let's talk about Circle of the... Oh, my God. He was going to end then us to death on that. Look, I love Circle of Moon. I think it's great that they're getting some new things, some new gimmicks, and I love the changes. I do. Jeez, that has got to have been the most things added to a subclass so far out of all of the other classes I've covered. It really felt like this entire video was just going to be Circle of the Moon. It was just, you know, you've seen Dude Where's My Car, the, the they go through the drive-thru, and then, and then, and then, like, dude, enough is enough. We're ha over halfway through the video. You've only gone over one subclass. Like, jeez. Too much. Too much. You're already overcomplicating the the already complicated wild shape. Like, at first I thought it sounded like this is going to be a little bit easier to follow, but not anymore. Like, just leave it at the, the beast's health. Like, the, the beast's hit points were temporary hit points. So everyone understood Everyone who understood Wild Shape understood that. Nobody was like, oh, that triggers this thing because you hit zero. No, I didn't. I'm still at full health. No, didn't trigger shit. Like, that, you overcomplicated it. But we'll, we'll make do, right? We're, we're all smart people. We play we play Dungeons & Dragons, so we're all nerds. We we understand basic arithmetic at the very least. So we'll, we'll make do. We'll make it work. It's fine. It's good. Whatever. But you didn't need to add 50, like, zillion goddamn things. Like, for real? For real.
too much, guys. Too much. We get it. You favor Circle of the Moon Druids. Fine. The land for the Druid. Circle of the Land is the Druid subclass that is all about your spell casting. And we have enhanced this subclass in a number of significant ways. One of the biggest ways we have enhanced it is right away when you get the subclass. It used to be that you selected a type of land that your druid was connected to, and that gave you an expanded spell list. That was cool, but it meant you were sort of locked in. Uh, and we really wanted to amp up the sense that as a member of this subclass, you are kind of like the ultimate nature magician. And so to support that, we've now made it so that every time you finish a long rest is when you choose the type of land that you are connected oh, to. Oh, nice. Okay. And so now, um, Every time you finish a long rest, you choose arid land, polar land, temperate land, or tropical land, and that gives you a set of spells that are available to you for that day. And again, you could change every day uh, which of those you want to be connected to. Hey, Druid, you want to be a ranger? Pick favorite terrain every day. Why? Why? I mean... Druids love all nature. They don't need to pick a, spe a specific terrain. This doesn't make any sense. Circle of land or no, it doesn't make any sense. This is a, this is a ranger thing. Leave it with the rangers. They're already a shit class anyway. Okay? Like, I don't... Like, I understand this isn't the same as favored terrain, but it's it's favored terrain. Right? It's, it's favored terrain with different steps. Like, I don't... Or if you have... A strong thematic reason to be connected to just one you also have the option to always be connected to one of these land types but we wanted to give you more flexibility as a circle of the land druid and we also uh, in creating these four new lists also optimize them so that they each have sort of spicy, really good reasons for you to select them. This is one of my favorite abilities we have Lands Aid. So Lands Aid is a brand new feature in Circle of the Land that gives the Circle of the Land Druid a new way to use their wild shape. Because they are the spellcasting focused mm -hmm. Druid, we didn't want them to feel like their wild shape was sort of sitting there unused, even though, even yes, though they it could is. use it to get a wild companion. Uh, we wanted to but give forget them have it. a way to use Wild Shape that really speaks to their subclass But don't forget they have it. And so that's what Land's Aid is all about. You can burn Wild Shape uses to this cause this them. eruption of, of nature magic that both, as you said, uh, harms enemies but also can heal somebody and really speaks to the two sides of Druidic magic because Druidic magic is, yes, about healing, but also about elemental destruction. And so Land's Aid was uh, really a fun, brand new feature uh, for us to provide in this subclass. I always like to be able to harvest my enemies <laughs> <laughs> for hit points. <laughs> but then we, we keep going on really leaning into the circle of the land being a consummate nature magician in natural recovery. This already in 2014 allowed the druid to gain uh, some spell slots back, but we've also now made it that with this, you can cast one of your level one spells from your circle spell feature without expending a spell slot. So tax evasion. Circle of the land can commit tax evasion. That's all that is. In a way, it's stretching your spell slots out even more than it did in 2014. Then in Nature's Ward at level 10, you not only are going to get a, a damage resistance that is associated with the land type you chose for your earlier feature, Ugh. Circle of the Land spells, 
Uh, but you are also now immune to the poison condition with this feature. A real quick, go back to the amazing flexibility this subclass now has, because not only do you get to choose the list of spells that you're getting each day from your Circle of the Land spells feature, but when you reach level 10, that choice each day then is also determining a damage resistance that you're getting. Finally, Nature's Sanctuary also uh, has brand new design uh, for the, this druid uh, at level 14, where you have yet another oh. non-shape-shifting use for your wild shape, right. where you can cause trees and vines to erupt in an area, giving you and your allies half cover, uh, and also sharing with all of your allies in that area the resistance you currently have from your nature's ward. That's fantastic. This, this subclass has enough change that it really is in the category of almost a brand new subclass. Yeah, absolutely. But it's not. And this again, that wish fulfillment, like this is <laughs> causing these trees and these vines to grow to protect all of your friends. That is a classic feeling druid trope, right? And, and especially for the circle of the land. This, yeah. this is for any player who really has come to the druid to lean all the way in on all oh, the nature magic. Uh, and this druid in particular, if they wanted to, could burn through all their wild shape uses and never turn into an animal or, or turn into an animal. Uh, it's players. Don't choice. forget they can turn it's into an animal. The autumn Halloween vibe Dru <laughs> yes. druid. If you so, if, if you wanted to play it that way. Let's talk about. Look, <laughs> I don't have a problem with with anything that they did with the the circle of the land. I don't. I think it's cool. Um, I think it's flashy and cool. And I think a lot of the features won't be used because people will forget about their wild shape charges because they already forget they can wild shape. Um, it's the only class that can do it so people forget that they can do it and it's not overly useful like the paladin divine smite uh it's moderately useful in certain aspects it's mostly like a role play thing um which you know i love role play in my game so it's great but i i do like this the circle of the land i think it's not going to be used by most players um it, I I haven't even seen the other two yet, and I already know Circle of the Moon is going to be the most played subclass of all the Druid subclasses because of everything they added to it, you know. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. It looks like we're going to do what a Circle of the Sea. Um, I don't. I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't know all the subclasses yet because I haven't watched this video. But I don't know. It's just I don't know. The Circle of the Sea, which is a, a brand new sea. subclass uh, in this book. So this subclass is all about not only channeling the magic Water. of oceans, but also of storms. Yeah. Uh, we realized Water. when we were building out the quartet of subclasses for every class in this book Water. that the Druid, with its Circle of the Land and Circle of the Moon, and then we also knew we wanted to bring in the circle what? of the stars. We were missing when it comes to uh, sort of the terrestrial side of the Druid's fantasy. We were missing a subclass that had to do with oceans. Yeah. And so that's what this what? subclass Dur is all about. And so you see that in the circle of the sea spells that they have access to, or again, it's this mix of aquatic and stormy themes. And we wanted to connect these two because not only are SpongeBob so cosplayers favorite subclass now in our world, we also wanted to make sure that this druid had things in their kit that are useful even when they are far away from a body of water. Essentially, the, the storm component was critical to make sure we did not have an Aquaman problem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you're not gonna have an Aquaman always, problem. You're gonna have a Patrick Star and SpongeBob problem. <laughs> Within Nobody cares about Aquaman. Themed character option in yeah. DNA. Hey, hey, I see you thinking Aquaman's cool.
Fuck Aquaman. Submariner. <laughs> the idea is you don't want to have a situation where the character feels like they have nothing to offer unless they're in or near a body of water. Because then it's very easy as a dungeon master, like you are either having to <laughs> find pools of water <laughs> or the dungeon master forgets and then you don't get to be you know, the, the core of what you are trying to play. Exactly. Yeah, so to lean into, into that, idea, we'll see. Uh, having something you can do no matter where you are, yeah. uh, we right away at level three in this subclass give you a feature called Wrath of the Sea. Oh. And just as the circle of the land has ways to use their wild shape that are other than uh, transforming into an animal, and we'll see this theme repeated yet again when we get to Circle of the Stars, uh, the Circle of the Sea Druid can expend a use of Wild Shape as a bonus action to manifest this sort of swirling, stormy ocean spray yeah. around themselves uh, that, you, that relies on, like the Paladin's Aura does on the new Emanation yeah. area of effect. While this is blasting around you, uh, you can, once per turn, uh, cause it to sort of storm up and uh, force a target to make a constitution saving throw. And uh, if they fail, they're gonna take some cold damage from this, uh, this very chilly ocean spray and you can also potentially hurl them away from you. So yeah. it's very dynamic. Uh, it's essentially a way for you to bring the ocean with you. Yes. Uh, this is this is also a way that we are we are avoiding the Aquaman problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bring bring it with you, my friend. And it's a great spell list too. We've got fog cloud, gust of wind, ray of frost, shatter, thunder wave, lightning bolt. Yes. Water breathing, control water, ice storm, conjure elemental, hold monster. Like these are all fantastic spells to have. Yes. Yeah. This was. The Circle of the Sea Druid is going to be extremely formidable. <coughs> no, yeah. it's not. Uh, and you see that at level six, where then your Wrath of the Sea emanation gets even bigger. So you're, you will have even more target options as your little mini ocean blasts uh, people around you. And it increases by 10 feet. Yes. Which is <laughs> quite a lot. Yeah. And then you also gain a swim speed equal to your speed. You're getting, you're layering on more to your, your base abilities here. And and then that theme continues at level 10 with Stormborn, where well, while your Wrath of the Sea is active, then you also gain a fly speed equal yeah. to your speed, uh, and you what? have resistance to cold, lightning, and thunder damage. Uh, so you are, you're just going Resistant to cold, thunder, lightning damage, fine, whatever. The swim speed, cool, makes sense, you're in the sea. Fly speed? What? Absolutely fucking lootly not. That doesn't fit at all. Um, before you go, oh, but it's the, it's the sea in the storm. No. 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 First of all, it's circle of the sea. Circle of the sea. Um... Yeah, there's, you know, storm, magic, fine, whatever. Flying? Have you ever flown? Have you ever been in a plane flying through a storm? Birds stay away from storms because they don't want to get, you know, lightning struck out of the goddamn sky. Flying does not fit for a storm. It doesn't fit for sea. It doesn't fit. Why are they getting a fly speed? Like, I've been fine with everything this entire video all the way up until now i'm putting my foot down on this the fly speed makes zero goddamn sense other than we really want somebody to pick something other than circle of the moon <laughs> it's dumb it's dumb it doesn't fit i hate it i hate everything about it that's the first thing i've i've actually legitimately disagreed with in this entire video going to turn into this this walking swimming and flying storm storm <laughs> yeah uh, and with swirling ocean waters around you uh, and then at level 14 with the feature oceanic gift you now have the option to manifest that moving 
oceanic storm around somebody else. My wife and I are very obsessed with the fog. John Carpenter is the fog. We're like, ooh, we can make a really creepy druid out of this one, where it's this fog constantly swirling around you. Well, welcome to Circle of the Sea. Yeah. <laughs> Circle of the Stars. Here's the thing. With the exception of the fly speed, Circle of the Sea seems super fun, seems fantastic. It also seems overly complicated and like nobody's going to pick it. I know I'm wrong. I know people are going to pick it and that's fantastic. I hope they do. Make sure you bring your reading glasses and your calculator because I'm going to strike you out of the goddamn sky with your own storm because fly speed doesn't make any sense. But no, for real though, I don't see this seeing a whole lot of play. It's going to see some play, especially with it being new. It's going to see some play until they realize how absolutely godforsakenly convoluted it is. I don't even have the player's handbook in front of me right now, and I know that it's poorly written and super convoluted. Just by the way he was describing everything. Um... I hope it's not. I hope I'm wrong and he just doesn't know how to read his own book. Um, but it's it's not going to see more play than Circle of the Moon. Which is weird because as I've been saying the majority of this video, so many Druid players forget about their wild shape and the whole point of Circle of the Moon is wild shape. But Circle of the Stars, maybe this can win it. I doubt it considering there's only three minutes left of this video. This is... Uh, a really lovely subclass that we That's introduced. That's why it gets the least amount of time. Uh, Tasha's lovely. Cauldron of Everything. This is all about drawing your powers from the nature that is up there. So Circle of the Land is all about the nature that's under your feet. Circle up of the where? Sea, all about the powers of nature in ocean. Hello everyone, today we are talking about the druid. There is a ton of... Sorry, I uh, dropped my, uh, almost dropped my can, I knocked it over a little bit. Our powers. There you go from the nature that is up there. So circle of the land is all about the nature that's under your feet. Circle of the sea, all about the powers of nature in oceans and in the storms associated with them. Circle of the moon now, we, we now start looking up toward the sky, is about how the powers above affect the druid themselves, and then the circle of the stars in a way the camera the pa camera pans back to look at the entire night sky and the forces of nature up there and how the druid can draw those forces down to help people to harm people and also gain glimpses into the future by reading the stars above other than shifting the levels around so that you get you get the subclass features at level three. This is largely going to be uh, what people saw in Tasha's Cauldron, but again, just- But enhanced by the core class. Exactly. So the, the circle of the stars in this book is now better because of the core class that it is attached to. Right. Uh, because you can now take circle of the stars and integrate it with those choices, those primal order choices you're making in the base class, uh, how you're deciding to use your wild shape, and Circle of the Stars, of course, gives you yet more ways to use your wild shape as you manifest different um, starry powers uh, based on the constellations you decide uh, to manifest. Uh, I think even people who have already been playing Circle of the Stars are going to feel that this is the best version of the subclass they've encountered yet because, again, of how it benefits from the new Druid base class. I also like the idea of a benevolent um, Stars Druid out there, the light that is in 
and the darkness. But in between those stars is uh, the great old one, the warlock. <laughs> and now looking and of, around. And of, course, of course you want to bring everything back, bring to, back the to the warlock. <laughs> so, no, I mean, I'm not surprised that they didn't really change anything from the, the circle of the stars because they didn't have any time in this video. <laughs> There's always going to be at least one subclass in every class where they decide, eh, I'm not going to change anything. That's fine. Whatever. Uh, here's the thing. The Druid is the least placed class in D&D. &D. Oh, sorry. Oh, pardon me. <clears throat> the Druid's the least played class in D&D. &D. It's the least played class in Baldur's Gate 3. It's the least played class. And there's a reason for that. The reason, it's not because it's not fun. It, it's fun. It's just as fun as any class, right? Well, other than the ranger, but I'm not touching that right now. Um, it's it's because it is leaps and bounds. The most confusing, the most convoluted, the most complicated class in the entire book. The Artificer, which isn't even a core class that you would think is more complicated because guns and grenades and shit like that is less complicated than the druid so many people go oh, i want to play a druid and then they look at it and they try reading through it and they go what the hell is this i don't know what the hell this is i don't know what i'm doing here and they decide nah, i'm just gonna go ahead and make a fighter that seems simple it is it's simple so it's just why it's the most played class it's the simplest class it's not the most fun class, in my opinion. Some people would disagree, and I call them boring. Those are the same people that play that use Sword and Shield and Monster Hunter, right? Those are the same people that, that play Go Fish at parties because they're boring. Fine. Whatever. But the Fighter is the simplest class. That's why it's the most played class. The Druid is the most complicated class. That's why it's the least played class. Okay? It's... And they, they went, let's take the most complicated class in Dungeons and & Dragons and make it more complicated. Let's take this class that nobody's playing because they can't understand how and make it more difficult. Why? Why? Like, I will when I get the book, I will read through it and I will break this class down and I hope it becomes one of the most played classes after I break it down. I really do because the Druid class seems to be so fun. Everyone I know that plays it has so much fun playing it. They think it's a great class. They think it's a super fun class. And I love that for them. And I want more people to be able to play it. But nobody wants to try and decipher what is hieroglyphics to them. Because it's so complicated. Because they don't care. Jeremy Crawford doesn't care that he's confusing the hell out of his players. I'm starting to think he's getting a kick out of it. Look at all the stuff we added to make it more complicated. <laughs> like, why? Why? I There's only one thing in this entire video I don't like, and that's the fly speed for the circle of the sea. Like, doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. That's the only thing from this entire video I don't like, right? But the Druid is going to continue being one of the least played classes because they keep making it more and more complicated. When the Player's Handbook comes out, when I have it, I will break down the Druid fully on how to play it. I will. I feel like I have to at this point because they made it more complicated. But uh, that was the Druid. So... I hope you guys liked it, and um... <laughs> look, if you guys have anything you want to say to me, please feel free to say it in the comments below. I Like I said earlier, I love hearing from you guys. I love having conversations. Um, my last two videos have, for some reason, uh, made their way into completely different content sectors of um, of YouTube. My, um, what was it? My fighter and, let's see here. Of course, now my phone doesn't want to load. Oh, yeah. My fighter and my monk videos. 
my monk video is at 42 views as of recording this and it's been out for a couple days and when i looked at the what videos are are um advertising it it's these russian videos for some reason i don't know how it managed to make its way over there but i don't like it if you guys could go and give it a watch um i'd greatly appreciate it it's an hour long i don't expect you guys to watch it especially since it's mostly just me ranting about not liking the monk and uh hating everything about the entire video because it's 40 it's 40 minutes their video is 40 minutes of them saying oh look at all the stuff we changed and me opening up the player's handbook and going actually that's how it was in the 2014 book so you didn't change anything <laughs> the fighter one however i think you guys will like so Please, if you could, give those a like. Or not a like. Give those a watch. If you like them, give them a like. Comment on them. You know, get them out of the, for some reason, oddly Russian sector they've made them made themselves in. I don't know how. Um, I've got to put my keyboard back together because I was taking it apart after spilling soda. Once again, I apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> if you like this video, go ahead and you know give me a like, give me a comment, uh, subscribe. I greatly appreciate and pray it. I appreciate all of you and all the support you guys have given. Um, and keep an eye out for my community posts because I'm going to be streaming again real soon here. I'm going to try and stream every Saturday. But the timing on that is going to vary based off of work schedule. So, uh, yeah. Thanks for watching.